This is Ross Feingold on the Taiwan Hashtag program, coming to you from Taipei, Taiwan, hosted by Storm Media, where you get the best analysis of the Taiwan election. Yes, you may have heard there was an election here in Taiwan this past Saturday, and we've been talking about it for about six months, so hopefully you are well aware that there was an election. We've been talking about the polls. We were talking about the factors that might lead to a victory by one or the other of the two main candidates, incumbent President Tsai Ing-wen of the Democratic Progressive Party and Han Yu of the Gomindang or Chinese Nationalist Party, who is also the mayor of Kaohsiung. Let's look at the final results. Here we have both the percentage of the vote received by the candidates as well as their total vote. A blowout victory for President Tsai, no doubt about it. Here's one interesting thing about this result. It's fairly consistent with the polls. So in the months leading up to the election, we talked about many different polls and how President Tsai had a widening lead in polls from various media. This was the case really from September onward. So after the summer, as people started to pay attention to the election, and this is very normal for any election that occurs in the fourth quarter or in the first few weeks of the following year. The United States is a very good example. Elections occur in November, people start paying attention after the summer. After summer holidays, kids are, go back to school, parents start to tune into the election. Younger voters, they spend their summer enjoying themselves and they go back to school themselves, university students, they start to pay attention to the election. So once the Kuomintang had selected its candidate, and remember their primary was in July, that's when Han Yu became their candidate officially, people paid attention to what the candidates were saying, what their policies were, and the polls started to show that that deficit that Tsai Ing-wen had had earlier in the year against unknown candidates, we'll talk about that more in a second, but that deficit that Tsai Ing-wen had earlier in the year started to reverse and Hong Yu started to fall far behind. There was this period in the last month or so where Hong Yu told his supporters, if you get the phone call from the pollsters, tell them you're gonna vote for Tsai Ing-wen, you're not gonna vote for me. And, and that and Han supporters started to say, well, you know, you can't believe the polls because the polls uh, don't reflect the actual support of uh, Han voters. Clearly, that was not the case. So people from the Gomindang or Han, Han voters who said Han is still going to win, don't believe those polls. They were definitely wrong. So this is one election where pollsters generally got it correct. So we'll have to give a, a shout out to the pollsters from the various polling agencies who gave Tsai Ing-wen a, a 12, 15 point lead. Actually, it turned out they underestimated it a little bit because James Song Chuyu just had a disaster election. Now, we talked about that before. The difficulty he would have getting the 13, a little, he got a little less than 13% in the 2016 election. So, uh, a lot of that support that may have gone to Song, you know, it dissipated out. Some of it may have gone to Han, a lot of it may have gone to Tai as well. But, blowout election. So, why did those polls reverse? We have to keep in mind. DPP did very poorly in the local election in November 2018. President Tsai had to resign as party chairperson. There was the unknown candidate. So for months, President Tsai was polling against the unknown, whether it was going to be Han Go Yu or Eric Ju Li Lun or someone else for the Gomindang, whether there was going to be an unaffiliated, a party unaffiliated candidate. For a long time, there was speculation that Mayor Ko wen of Taipei City was going to run as an unaffiliated candidate, not, not for a political party. So a lot of that polling was basically asking the voters something they didn't know. I mean, back in January, February, March, the voters didn't know who the candidates were going to be. And then subsequently, President Tsai was challenged in a party primary by William Lai Ching De, her former premier, who's now the vice president-elect. So they, they were able to make up their differences. And, and uh, he was on the ticket as the vice president. May have helped. Uh, he, he's still a popular guy, even though he lost the primary. May have helped with some of this amazing result for President Tsai. Uh, so some of those polls earlier in the year, they said, oh, President Tsai has no chance of winning. Well, keep in mind that she was being polled against the, the unknown, unknown for the Gomindang, unknown for a possible third uh, candidate, an unaffiliated candidate, not with a political party. So have to keep in mind that once the candidates were known, 
once their, their positions within their parties were consolidated, uh, a lot of unity in the DPP. People who had supported uh, William Lai, uh, you know, they, they came back on board. William Lai said, uh, you know, I'm going to endorse President Tsai. She eventually asked him to be her running mate. So unity on the, on the DPP side, no unity on the Dong side. So Terry Gotai Ming, who ran in the party primary for president, left the party a few weeks later. He sent an open letter saying, I'm out of here. I don't like the party anymore. Eric Julie Lund, the, the uh, third vote getter in the KMT primary, kind of went quiet for a few months and then he sort of started to get involved in campaigning for legislative candidates a little bit. Then eventually he was given a title as, as, as a, a campaign uh, leader, but it was really late, it was in December. So he sort of kind of joined the Han campaign. It may have helped for a few weeks, but very quickly, uh, you know, couldn't overcome the, the difficulties that Han Goyu had. So let's talk about the difficulties that Han Goyu had and why it resulted in such a, a huge gap with President Tsai Ing-wen. Well, the first difficulty Han had was articulating what his policies were. We talked about this on many previous programs. Doesn't matter if it's energy policy, wages, uh, elder care, all these various public policy issues that voters in Taiwan are concerned about. When Han Goyu was asked about it or, or how to explain his policies at some of the candidate forums or at the one debate with the other two candidates, it was clear he struggled to articulate his policies. And somebody might say, well, Ross, it worked for him in Kaohsiung in 2018 and he got elected mayor. Yes, but different situation. He was running for mayor, not for president. People's expectations are different for mayor. We see that in other cities in Taiwan as well. Ko wen got elected mayor uh, based a lot on his personality, saying, look, I'll just do the right thing as mayor. It worked for him in 2014. He didn't have a mastery of all the policy issues. So Hong Gul, you didn't have a mastery of the policy issues in 2018, but he had a lot of enthusiasm. Uh, he contrasted a bit with the candidate for the DPP. Uh, who didn't have the same level of enthusiasm, was a bit more policy-oriented, but it wasn't look what the voters were looking for in the city. Mayor Han, or uh, candidate Han, when he was running for mayor, said, you know, I'll, I'll make the city more prosperous. And people say, okay, we get it. Uh, that, that'll work for mayor. It didn't work for a presidential election. There's a lot more issues at stake. Obviously, President Tsai, having been uh, in office for four, nearly four years, had a mastery of policy issues. She was able to articulate what her government's policies and achievements were. Now, some people may criticize those achievements and say, well, you know, uh, economic growth is, is okay, but wage growth is stagnant. Uh, energy policy, uh, you know, you say you want to get rid of nuclear, but we're not sure if there'll be enough renewables. So, of course, they're criticisms of the policy execution. But here's, here's an interesting thing about that. The Kuomintang struggled, along with Han himself, to articulate what their own policies were, what their criticisms were. So when President Tsai said, well, here are all the great things that I've been doing for nearly four years, here are all the achievements of my government, very difficult for the Kuomintang to respond to that. So not only did Han lack the mastery of the policy issues, but he didn't have a support of a good party headquarters. So the party headquarters uh, didn't really provide Han with sufficient support to articulate these issues, to master the public policy issues, or have enough surrogates out there to help with that. Then uh, the result was Han's election campaign, which was headquartered in Kaohsiung, had to establish its own policy unit. So you have, you have the party headquarters, you have Han's policy team, uh, you also have his campaign team. Then late, later in the year, in December, as we talked about before, Eric Julie Lun came on board as some kind of uh, campaign chairman, even though it was only about uh, a, a little more than a month before the campaign. So we see the Kuomintang completely disunited. No unity at all at the Kuomintang. So we have these competing power centers, inconsistent messages, not helping the candidate win the election, not giving him the strength he needs from a, a apparatus perspective to help. So it's no surprise that during this period of time, we see the Kuomintang not lacking unity and, and no policy uh, articulation. So of course, the polling numbers started to cross and they continue to cross quite dramatically. And no surprise that after this disastrous election result, 
the Kuomintang supporters uh, are, are calling on Wu Duni and all the party leadership to resign. They've already announced their intention to resign, but typically in Taiwan, people announce their intention to resign. There'll be a bunch of people say, no, no, why don't you stay? We still love you. So uh, angry party members are saying, no, all the party leadership has got to go. They just did a terrible job. Contrast that with the DPP. As we said, unity, complete unity. William Lai supporters came back and came back to, to the cause. Policy issues, able to articulate all their policy achievements over the last uh, nearly four years in government. Um, legislative candidates, obviously a strong slate. We'll talk about that in future programs, uh, but clearly uh, they were able to retain their majority. So a good team out there campaigning for the president and linking it. So they're saying, vote for me as a legislative candidate. I'm gonna support the policy goals of President Tsai also very helpful for, pro for President Tsai's impressive uh, numbers. And then we have to be frank, the DPP and together with the government, masters at social media and use of, of traditional media. So on TV all the time, hammering away at Han Goyu, saying, well, well, you know, he's only been a mayor for about a year. He hasn't even really done a great job uh, making accusations about how he financed the purchase of an apartment there were accusations about the extramarital affair and this mystery Ms. Wong, who Han allegedly bought a flat for in the Taipei suburbs. Very ineffective response from the Han campaign. Of course, he said it's unfair. They're, they're attacking me. They're blackening my name. He, he did say that, but Han really struggled to convince the voters that it was unfair. I mean, this is politics. This is electoral politics. The other side is allowed to beat you up. Mr. Han, and, and you can't just uh, you know, say, oh, it hurts, it's unfair, it hurts my feelings. So ineffective response by the Han campaign to the very strong negative campaigning by the DPP, and we shouldn't idolize the DPP uh, and just say, oh, they're great, they love democracy. Of course they love democracy, that almost goes without saying, but very effective at, at, at hammering away at Han Yu and saying he's a bad guy. Um, you know, these potential corruption allegations, potential extramarital affairs, and it worked, and good on the DPP. They were able to make use of all the tools available in a democratic society with a free media, and they did that very successfully. What about China? Everyone, everyone asks, oh, wasn't it the China and the Hong Kong factor? All these international media reports saying, oh, it was all the China Hong Kong factor. Well, of course that was a factor in the election. People are very concerned about China's threats to Taiwan. People in Taiwan were very concerned about events in Hong Kong. President Tsai talked about those very often over social media in the second half of 2019. Talked about her support for the protesters, her support for democracy in Hong Kong. Was it an important issue for the voters in this election? Of course it was. Is, is it the main factor for why President Tsai won by such a large margin? Of course not. Other factors are clearly in play, and that includes the disunity in the Kuomintang, uh, Han being a flawed individual as a candidate, uh, and the successful campaign tactics of the Democratic Progressive Party. They may have beaten any Kuomintang candidate uh, using the same tactics, but maybe by a smaller margin. Maybe a better Kuomintang candidate could have made this election closer, could have even won the election if what we were told about a year ago at this time had held true. But there are a variety of factors that resulted in this extraordinary election victory for President Tsai. And here are those numbers again, um, but it was not only the China factor. Yes, China's a factor. Yes, Hong Kong's a factor. But there are other domestic, purely domestic issues that were a factor in President Tsai's extraordinary election victory. I'm Ross Feingold. You've been watching Taiwan Hashtag, hosted by Storm Media.